I've got William Willis joining me on the show today. He's what you'd call a modern philosopher, a real world-class creator. You might have seen his writing or his sketches on LinkedIn or Twitter. It's really beautiful and really important what he's putting out there in the world. He's got a long history in the tech world as a software executive and also the co-founder more recently of the CoCreate community. If you want to check him out more, you can look him up at theprolificcreator.co. That's theprolificcreator.co. In this conversation, it was really rich. We talked about three big things. One was William's journey and his revelations as he spent decades in big tech and the startup world. And he got to a point prior to COVID where he couldn't take it anymore. And he was wrestling with, what do I do next in my career? And it really came to an abrupt halt. And he had a certain set of revelations as he started experimenting online and figuring out who he was and what he wanted to do with the precious time he has left on this earth. We also talk about what it is to build a tribe. How do you surround yourself with people and ideas? How do you be that master curator for your own life so that you are infused with ideas and people that uplift, inspire, and even scare you in all the right ways? And then we got to brass tacks. We talked about practical creativity. If you're a mid-career professional who feels a little bit entrepreneurial, and you want to see how you can bring your creativity out to the world, monetize it, see what it's capable of, this conversation is for you. We really roll up our sleeves on what it is to be creative in a practical sense. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. I will leave you with this. If you have not yet subscribed to Wednesday Wisdom, I don't know what you're waiting for. It's just packed full of goodness. Every week I roll out uncaged strategies and tactics and things that are helping a lot of people's lives. Check it out at matthewdone.com. Try it. You'll love it. I promise. That's Wednesday wisdom. All right, let's get to it. Growing up, society taught you to follow the script by choosing a career path and climbing the ladder. But for many people, this promise falls flat. Work suffocates them and life becomes painful. Here, you're trapped in what I call the corporate cage. Fortunately, there's a way out. You can take control of your corporate job and unlock a life of freedom. I call this living uncaged. Hi, this is your host, Matt Doan. I'm a coach, creator, and entrepreneur. Uncaging people is my mission because it's been my exact life journey. This show provides you the stories, principles, and tactics to make it happen. Welcome to Uncage Yourself. William, welcome to Uncage Yourself. Good, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me in. This has been a long time coming, my friend. We've had such great interactions for the last year or so on LinkedIn, and you've been creating this amazing message that I want to bring to the people of Uncage Yourself right now. So getting right in, you've got this long running thread in your life regarding science fiction, clearly from your childhood to, to now. I've heard about this in other podcasts. You've written about it. What's that all about? Well, I've, I've idolized kind of technology, the future, space in particular, uh, ever since I was a kid, it really captured my attention. And uh, I mean, everything I watch, everything I, I read is kind of flavored with that. And even when I went to, you know, uh, college or university, uh, I studied as an aerospace engineer, I had a dream of being an astronaut, uh, actually working on a space station, even building one. I mean, I, I just wanted to be involved somehow in, in, in space, space exploration, uh, and humanity's expansion into space. Uh, back then it was, you know, government run, um, a lot of, you had a lot of private companies, but they were mainly contracting into the, into the government. So you, it's not like today where you actually have some commercial enterprises. You got the, you know, Elon Musk and, and those, those, those people out there, uh, really doing some interesting things these days which I have to say has kind of renewed my interest. You know, I, I've, I've kind of lapsed in that, in that, uh, in that area, but science fiction too, um, has, has also been a big part of my life. I mean, Asimov is one of my favorites. Uh, some of the things he wrote about, um, you know, robotics and AI and, 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 and all those areas still fascinate me today. Uh, science in general fascinates me. You know, I used to be a big fan of black holes and I used to wanted to know everything I could about black holes. 
uh, and of course, black holes and what we know about them has changed over the years as well. So it's just, it's just a fascinating area. And, um, I, I truly am a technologist at heart. Uh, and that includes, I guess what months some people would call science fiction, because what is science fiction? It's just kind of imagining what science could be or will be, uh, in the future. And I, th I think some of the best writers have actually predicted fairly accurately where we are today and where we're headed. Uh, and that's also astonished me. So I think the, even, even in science, even in hard science, uh, I think the imagination is, an, is incredibly important. I think if you talk to theoretical physics and people kind of at that level, they'll probably tell you the same thing. Cause these are the people that have to constantly break out of that cage or break out of that, out of that box and really, you know, explore some really weird things, you know, they have to really stretch their minds in interesting ways. Um, and so I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, I would say I'm, I'm kind of in that part of science fiction, kind of more of a futurist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you talk about that, it reminds me, uh, of one of the scientists I love most, which I think you did too, is Richard Feynman. Oh yeah. And it makes me think about science and fiction science, which is getting to the factual, the understanding of the way things work. Right. And then mm -hmm. fiction, to your point, embracing the art of the possible, using imagination, bringing those two together. I think he was one of those that really embodied it in a unique way. And he was particularly adept at explaining complex things in, in terms that the everyday person could understand. And I mean that to say people who weren't uh, really deep in the science, in the sciences. Um, and I really respected him for that. Uh, I mean, someone, someone who's usually that intelligent, usually that deep in a subject typically doesn't teach very well. At least that's been my experience. Um, but he somehow did that masterfully. And, and, and I was also enthralled with that too. So I, I've always been a big fan of his. I love listening to him speak even today. And he's always a constant inspiration, especially in the, in the corporate world, you know, when I'm on the technology side and I'm trying to explain things to non-technology people, he's kind of my hero in that regard. Heck of a model to go after there. Yeah, so definitely you setting were, the bar high on that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Let's let's keep bringing him back to life and doing good things. Yeah. So you were talking about being a technologist, being in the technology world. I want to give it just a little bit of a backstory for folks, and I'll link to some other episodes and things that people can catch up with you on your biography. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you have this strong track record in the technology world, lots in software that you've talked about, and you love building things. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about your fascination with space, um, but I want to get to a point as you approached COVID, there was a time period where it seemed you were wrestling with being in the corporate world. Mentally, this was seemingly taxing. What was that mental state? What were you wrestling with as we neared COVID in your career? Well, there's, there's what we idealize about technology or heck, even our jobs in general. And then there's reality. And, and often the two don't mix. In fact, they conflict quite a bit. And I was, I was kind of getting into a period where I was getting a bit disillusioned with what I was doing and where I was going. Um, and this is, this is after a pretty lengthy career. I mean, I'm, I'm getting close to three decades of work in technology and kind of at the top of my game, really. Uh, and I just recently done some amazing things with amazing people. Uh, and so I'm coming down from that high as well. And add to that this little ticking time bomb of hey there's other things you need to do in life you know these there's these other dreams inside of me that i'd kind of suppressed over the years in favor of my job and the things i was doing not to say i didn't like my job i loved it but that's just one aspect of me and i think most people in general have many and varied interests it's just that we tend to really hone in on maybe one or two of them uh through our life actually and i don't think that's in incredibly healthy. And so I think that caught up with me. It, it's amazing. It took that long. Uh, but that's just how, you know, pig headed I am, you know, about my work. <laughs> I don't let too many things get in my way. And so I, I just kind of bull rush through everything, but that caught up to even me after a while. And so there's, you know, this is voice inside of me getting more insistent that, Hey, you know, we're, we're running out of time. Like you're, you're not getting any younger. You're getting to the age that things happen. You know, you gotta, you gotta pay attention to me now. There's something else we need to do here. And I didn't know what it was. It's something I had to figure out. I had to earn that knowledge. And so all of that combined together um, to, 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 got me to a point where I just said, you know what, I got to get out of here. I can't do this anymore. 
Uh, it wasn't even a, you know, I got to start working on something on the side, which is usually the healthier, probably more logical approach. But I had let it get too far and I just had to get out. And so I just left. I didn't have anything waiting for me. Um, but it was instant relief in the moment. It was just a huge weight off my shoulder and something I'd never done before, actually. <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, obviously scary, but I think the the relief outweighed the the fear that I had, at, the, at least in the moment. Uh, that's until I, I think I woke up maybe a few weeks later and then I was scared out of my mind. Like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're plugged in for years to the great safety nets, like the salary IV, the things we rely upon, the norms, the colleagues, and then you're isolated <clears throat> on your own. <laughs> right. That's a scary moment for sure, having experienced it uh, recently myself. Um, not so much overnight like you did. I can imagine <laughs> that had to be a lot to deal with. So fast forward, that was around when the pandemic started. Nice timing, really. Yeah, great. Really Brilliant nice timing, timing, right? I'm really pretty much known right? for that. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I saw you <clears throat> really take flight over the course of 2021, which is when we met on LinkedIn. I would yeah. love to just get a little bit of a snapshot what were you experimenting with over the course of that year? And what did you learn about yourself? Well, I think as, so as that year began, I actually began with ship 30 for 30. So up until that point, I was struggling with finding a medium for thinking through these things. Um, I, I decided on writing, actually, uh, trading programming for writing, probably I think around maybe August or September of the previous year in 2020. Uh, it, it, so it took me probably a good six months to get there, to figure all that out. Uh, and I've always been a pretty good writer, uh, mainly because I've been a great reader uh, all my life. I've, I've been a voracious reader throughout my life. And so my, 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 my vocabulary is pretty good. Um, writing has been a big part of my technology career as well. Uh, everything from writing pr proposals to trying to inspire other people, uh, with the work that we're doing or, or the culture we're trying to to build. So, but it's always been beside, behind a corporate wall, never anything publicly. And so I wanted to write publicly. I wanted to publish my work and I wanted to do it quickly. You know, I didn't want to like, uh, I didn't want to write really long papers or articles. I toyed with that a little bit, but that just wasn't for me. I'm more of a kind of a, you know, I'm thinking something, I want to get it down. I want to stick to a, a very specific point. I don't want to belabor things. And that's the, that's the engineer in me. I don't, I don't like extraneous things. You know, I like to get to the essence of the thing. Uh, I like simplicity. Uh, simplicity makes me feel comfortable, actually. Um, and so I was trying to figure out, well, how do I do that with writing? It just wasn't very clear to me. And so I finally came across this kind of like atomic essay idea where it's around 300 words and you stick to a point and you carve all the extraneous stuff out and you just boil it down to the essence of what you're trying to get across um, and not conflate too many things at once. And that just hit it for me. That was it. That just lit me on fire. Literally. I, I, I just, I, I kept writing. I couldn't stop writing. It just came pouring out. I had a lot of, I had a huge backlog in my brain of things that I needed to get out. And so I'd say for the first couple of months, it came out uh, in a torrent and then it started getting a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, then I had to kind of settle down and get into a groove, you know, establish my system, that sort of thing. But that, that was, that was the thing that turned the tide for me. And so at the beginning of the year, also something else that was really important, I gave myself space room. It's like, okay, you, you're I'm giving you the year to basically figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and we're going to do this through writing, drawing, and maybe a few other things that we might experiment with like video and things like that. But Writing and drawing or sketching were, were the two main mediums for me. And so that's what I did the whole year. So I did nothing but, sh you know, write, draw, share the work, engage with people, other thinkers like you. Um, and I, f I discovered quite a few things along the way. Uh, and we, we can talk, talk about some of that. But one of the things I discovered is that, you know, this journey is never intended to be easy. You know, you have to really work at it. You have to struggle. Struggle is really important for growing. You can't grow without that struggle, without that resistance. And that's something I really learned quite a bit throughout that year, because even though I wrote prolifically, uh, it was never easy because I'm sitting here grappling with some pretty deep thoughts. I mean, anybody who 
who followed me uh, last year, in fact, who follows me now, knows that I, I kind of dig into some pretty weighty things. I mean, my, my, <laughs> my writing is not for the faint of heart most of the time. And that's because I have a whole life that I'm exploring here. I'm, a lot of things that I'm grappling with personally. And I'm trying to figure out the aftermath of a, of a career that spanned many decades. I'm trying to make sense of where I'm supposed to go from here. And so and I'm digging into topics like, you know, philosophy, uh, stoicism in particular. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm tr just trying to follow other interests and see what happens, I'm trying to observe the patterns of my work. And that was important. In order for you to do that, you have to give yourself some space and time. Indeed. So that evolved in a way where you were trying different things, exploring and unpacking that life that you've <laughs> been living for several decades, and you wanted to see where it would go unbounded. Mm -hmm. You just said, yep. where do my interests, do my thoughts take me? Let me put things out in the universe without doing what everyone else says to do. When you are writing online and producing stuff, they say niche or, or niche down, right? Get to the point, like fixate on an audience, serve them, monetize it. And that, that works for some people. And there's a lot of people that show how that can work. You said, no, I'm going to go on my own path and see where this year takes me. And figure out what the creative side of William can be. So that evolved as we got into 2022, where we start to see what you call the prolific creator come on the scene. So as you experienced 2021, how did you think about packaging it and then displaying that to the world that we see right now? If you could unpack prolific creator, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so what what I, what I discovered actually, and I, di I didn't know this at the beginning of 2021 when I started writing, I started down this path is, you know, I, I followed a lot of the advice that was out there and a lot of it's great advice, but I think one piece of advice that was not good for me personally, um, was to really converge as quickly as possible on a niche, uh, you know, the idea of niching down. And I know it's well-intentioned, but I think a lot of people, it's the exact opposite of what they should actually do, especially somebody who, like me who focused so heavily in one area. Now, yes, you know, there, I've had other interests in my life and I've explored some of those, but largely it's been about one thing, technology. And, but I'm so much more than technology personally. There's, there's some you know, weird, quirky interests I have. There's some you know, fun things I like to do. There's some more serious things I'd like to explore in more depth that I haven't had a chance to do. How do I know that technology is like the, is, is kind of like the lodestone of my niche? I mean, it seems that's pretty presumptuous of me, you know, since I haven't given myself time to explore the other things. And so I think the best advice for somebody in my situation is I have to diverge first before I can converge again on my niche, because what that allows me to do um, is actually explore those interests um, and explore them with all this weight of expectation, obligation, uh, be creative in those areas and just see where I naturally gravitate. Uh, and then start trying to connect the thread through them. And that's what I noticed in hindsight. So I just probably about six months in, about halfway through 2021, I started noticing some patterns in my work. Uh, and I still didn't know how they fit together, but I at least had a much better idea of what my, my niche might be. Uh, and so I, did, I had no idea in 20, uh, at the beginning of 2021. In fact, what I started to discover was completely different from what I actually thought at the beginning which I think is a good example of what typically happens to people. Um, when you niche down too early, you tend to niche into something that's, uh, that's probably off the mark and it ends up becoming another job. Uh, and that's like the worst thing that could happen. I mean, a lot of us don't have a lot of time to waste here. You know, when we're, we're out of a job, you know, we're trying to make ends meet, we don't have copious amounts of time to figure these things out. And so, you know, choosing the wrong niche, that could set you aside three, six months, maybe more. Um, and so I, I, I think you've got to make room for this. Most, most of us have to make room to diverge first. And then we have to have some way to observe the patterns in our work. Uh, and, and once you start seeing those patterns, then you, you just start looking for that common thread running through some of them. And I didn't discover that until late uh, 2021. And it actually required the help of other people. Like, I don't think I could have done it myself. I needed the objectivity of other people seeing my work combined with my experience with my work and what I'm seeing. And that helped me kind of figure it out in the end. Yeah. You remind me of, and I think we've talked about this Jack Butcher's model, dice model, 
So you were diverging, right? Exploring Mm -hmm. a broad array of interests over time. And with the feedback and help of other people, you were able to converge towards a set of topics that really felt right to you, this almost golden thread. And then the E is emerge, the ability to kind of bring that out full throttle in a well-packaged format out to the world after you've Mm -hmm. gone through that process. Yeah, in fact, I, I even came up with my own acronym called EPIC. Um, and it's very similar to Jack uh, Butcher's, but I think it's, it's a little bit tailored more f- to what I actually experienced. And so the, and the first one is similar to his Diverge, which for me was just explore, because I've always been, another thing I'm, I'm really into is just adventure, exploration. You know, it's another thing about sp- why I like space so much, because I mean, what's bigger than space to explore, right? So anyway, um, exploring was the, was the first part for me. Uh, and so that's where the E comes from. And then the P is observing patterns uh, and patterns in software have been a big thing for me. Uh, and those, those people who've been in software for any length of time, they know what, they know what design patterns are. And so um, while you are exploring, while you're diverging, you want to actually start looking at your work in some way. So that means you have to keep track of your work somehow. Um, and so I had, of course, I had my own system for that that allowed me to do that. Um, and then, you know, once you start observing the, the patterns uh, in that, then you want to identify a thread. So you know, like for me, I had probably, a hand, I guess, a handful of, of content areas that I really gravitated towards. A good example of that is stoicism, uh, creativity, Kaizen, which is really mostly continuous improvement, small steps, that sort of thing, uh, sort of thing. And, and a few other areas. Um, and then the thread that ran through all of them, I found out later, um, was actually, it was one of the interest areas. It was creativity because creativity was a piece, a part of all of those things, at least the way I wrote about them and thought about them. Uh, and that thread for me, that's the niche. Uh, that's, that's what you're looking for. It's kind of that golden thread through your interest areas. And it may not, it's not going to be all of them. It may be through a a few of them. Um, I almost look at it as kind of like the tip of a spear. Uh, that's kind of what your niche looks like. And it, it kind of, you know, extends backwards into your other interest areas, and maybe fades a little bit more. There's, but there's always a concentrated tip where you have a few of those interests that are really concentrated at, at whatever season of your life you're in. And so then the C in, in, in Epic is to curate that content that you've created uh, to, to your niche. So you go back in hindsight, knowing what that niche is, and then you basically, you, you, you kind of you boil down the the work that you've already done into into the essence of it uh, with respect to your niche, and then you create products, right, and, and services from that. And so that's how you kind of ten or even hundred x the value of your work, because you're really boiling down all that knowledge and that wisdom into something incredibly valuable uh, for people to consume. But that would only be possible if you've done all that previous work, all the exploration work. Um, you know, and so in many ways, curating is, is kind of like converging, you know, it's, it's basically collapsing a lot of that stuff down into the essence of, of what your, what your niche ends up being. And so the Epic creator concept became, uh, I think pretty solid to me at the beginning of this year, actually. So it took me a whole year to figure all that out. Even, even staring Jack Butcher's dice in the face, it still took me some time to like apply that to my own life. Yeah. And I can see how that spin uh, was a little bit more meaningful for the creator that you found to be in figuring out how to make that meaningful for other aspiring creators. Now, I want to come back to some of the practicality of how someone might apply the epic creator mindset, especially for those that are in corporate and have this burning desire to be creative. We'll come back to that in a second. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned before the power of others, a group, a tribe, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, in being able to help you come to these conclusions, figuring out your golden thread, how you want to present your ideas to the world. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned this uh, using a term, one I had not heard before, uh, senius. Mm, Could you unpack what that means, what it meant to you? Sure. It's it's, It's a term that was coined by musician Brian Eno. Um, and I actually, um, I discovered it in Austin Kleon's show your work book, I think it was, uh, and it was fairly recently and I, I found the concept fascinating. It really resonated deeply with me. You know, 
we go through life doing things and kind of collecting our own wisdom. And then later on, somebody has a term for it, you know, and you're like, whoa, that's, that's that thing I've been doing all along. And it actually, somebody named it. Um, but it's very familiar to you. And a senior was that to me because I've experienced being in more than one senior actually throughout my life. And there's something magical about it. And, and really what it is, it's kind of a, it's, it's almost like an ecosystem of, you know, of, 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 I guess if we did it in, in the professional context, it's an ecosystem of professionals that have diverse backgrounds. Um, you'll see this concept popping up everywhere, not, not necessarily as, as, as a full blown seniors, but even in technology where we have scrum teams, right. Or, or agile teams, that concept is there. You know, you, you always want these teams that actually have a diverse set of backgrounds, a diverse set of skills, these kind of like, um, these multidiscipline teams. Uh, those tend to work best. And there's a reason for that because the, the, the influence of other disciplines right, is very important in that kind of work. Uh, it, it prevents you from having the blinders on and being too overly focused in a specific area. Uh, what I've learned about ideas over time is that the best ideas are those that are, that are cross-pollinated from other disciplines. And so that's why it's also important to explore your interest because when you explore your interests, it helps inform the ones that you're really focused on now. It really gives you these interesting ideas. And I think that's the birth of innovation is when these ideas are floating around, they kind of cross pollinate. Uh, and so that's the key idea to a senior is you have a group of people who are really working creatively in certain areas, uh, but there's a way they work. That's what can, that's what unites them. So there's, there's a way that they choose you know, to, to work with other people where they're very open-minded, uh, you know, they have skills they want to learn from other people that they don't have themselves, but they're willing to share their skills in return. Uh, they love the objectivity that other people bring, the other perspectives that other people bring. And they like having an environment that's somewhat protected from the outside world. You know, because when you're, when you're a bit of a provo provocateur and a rebel, you need a little bit of that protection because you're kind of putting your neck out there. You know, you're doing things that maybe people haven't seen or familiar with. And, and as we all know, that that frightens some people or that makes some people defensive or they, they think you're strange. Um, and so it helps to have that, you know, somewhat of a cocoon effect. And a scene, is not something you can purposely build. I mean, you can try, but there's just some magic about it. It's almost like casting the crew for a movie. You know, you, 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 have, you want talent people trying to cast those people, but you can't artificially build chemistry, right? It has to naturally form. Um, and maybe some people have a good eye for, for seeing that sort of thing. Um, but I think every human being knows what that feels like. They know what chemistry feels like. And so it, you know, seniors, in order to find one for yourself, you start with your interests, you look for people that have similar interests, you start engaging with them and you'll feel that resonance with them. You know, it's a, it's a, on a deep level where you could feel like you could talk to them for hours. Those are the kind of people you want in a seniors, right? Those are the people that just really stretch your mind in interesting ways. And you cover all these, these wonderful topics. And it just, you feel like you, you know, you could go on and on and on, you know, uh, just for days, weeks, months. Uh, and that's the kind of an environment that a seniors is. It, it really fuels you creativity, creatively. And it's really, I would, I would, I would summarize it as a group genius. You know, this, this idea of, of lone geniuses out there solving all the world's problems. That's not really the way it works. The way it works is human beings work together. We're meant to work together. That's, that's how we are fundamentally. That's how we're at our best. And it doesn't mean that we don't have insanely great individual talent. We do. Uh, it's just that we're so much better when we combine those insanely great talents together because then we get so much more from it. Uh, and that is the power of a seniors, I think. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at community, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at where do I find my seniors? Great description. Community, if you look at probably the last 12 months, say over the course of 2021 and into 2022, community is probably one of the most buzzwordy things out there. And there's all sorts of communities <laughs> popping up. And I think what I take away from that seniors overview is you have to be very smart about selecting and designing the environment you want to interact with. And in this case, the people mm -hmm. being very selective upon because you can only have so much influence that you can take in almost so much capacity for ideas and meetings right. and Zoom sessions and all these things. So we have to be very careful to always be leveling up 
saying goodbye to maybe people and ideas that don't serve us anymore in finding groups of people, whether they're behind some formal gate, maybe there's a whole group of them, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe those are just a series of one-on-one -on -one connections that you build your own network with. And then, right. you know, we kind of started that way in our one-on-one -on -one, and then we're kind of hanging yeah. them out, hanging out among similar people at this point. And there's a network effect sure. to that, but you have to be very cognizant of designing the environment, the people that you engage with so that they are pulling you up to where you want to be and that you are designing where it's headed. Right. So right. I might need to, pay to get into this community. I might need to ask or, or trade some skill of mine for access to someone else's time, right? There's a bartering, like yeah. there's all sorts of interesting things, but if you want to level up and unlock your genius with the power of the group, right? We have to be creative and intentional in who we're spending time with. And that isn't handed to you on a silver platter in corporate. It's not going yeah. to naturally be your career manager or your project colleagues. Like <laughs> once in a blue moon, like maybe... 5% of those people will be that person you're looking for if you're lucky. But in right. reality, if you want to be your highest self, you want to stretch your legs professionally and personally, you're going to have to create this uh, almost like psychic dynamite, like Churchill would say, that stuff that, like you're going to have to put it out there in the world and make it explode on your own. Like this is my own right. way of creating the interactions I want in this world, right? Yeah. And I, I think in, in many ways, you, you actually have to go outside of the job to find mm -hmm. these things. Um, but I think that's, that's healthy. It's natural to, to, to look outside, you know, to find those people because you have complete control over that. You don't have a whole lot of control over who you work with. I mean, you have some control, but it's like a game of Plinko, you know, you, you're able to drop the chip in, but once it starts clanking around, you have no idea where it's going to go next. Um, and so that's kind of what, what a job's like, but, but outside the job, you know, that you could join whatever interest group you want. You could choose the people that you hang out with. <clears throat> And, you know, that's valuable time. That's time that, you, you, that you're investing in yourself. And so you, you really want to choose wisely. And I think it all starts with following your interests. Because if these people are at least in your interest areas, you're not really wasting time. You know, you're, you're spending value. You're, you're using that time very wisely. You're, every, every conversation is an investment in yourself. Um, you know, I, there, there has to be a selfish element to all of this. Because if if you're just giving, 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 giving all the time and you're not giving any, getting anything in return from it, it's going to suck you dry. Um, and you have to, it's, you know, it's just like anything, kindness, any kind of value that you offer, you have to have it within you first uh, before you can actually give it to other people. So you have to care for yourself. And I think caring for yourself is making sure that your interests, you know, are you know, that you actually explore those interests. Because if you're not exploring your interests, then it's going to be hard for you to grow personally. Just think of all the regret, the regret that's going to compound over time. We can forecast exactly how that's going to feel. Let me come first full circle to helping people who are feeling caged, right? We've got a hypothetical situation. I want you to apply your creator mindset on helping them. So here's the scenario. You've got someone, a knowledge worker, someone that's in IT or data science or marketing or something to that effect. They've got their brain power is what gives them a career. And they've been crushing it for years. Say they're in their mid 30s. They've been climbing the ladder. You know what that feels like, right? And on paper, very successful. But inside, they're feeling caged. They're feeling roadblocked, lost, maybe a little resentful at this point. And they know that some type of creativity is their path to feeling better, maybe even unlocking a different form of a career and exploring this other side of them. So they're feeling caged. They know they have to be creative. What sort of advice would you have to someone that doesn't have a lot of times working in the nine to five, got a lot of responsibilities at home and work? How do they start to explore this creative side of them? Uh, I think a good technique I've, I've kind of stumbled across, uh, this was from Julia Cameron in The Artist Way, is this idea of an artist date. And I, I expand that to kind of this idea of a creator date, which is one time a week. Like, it's almost like having a date with yourself and, or your inner creativity, your inner creative child, you call it what you will, right? But it's that thing inside of you that's, that's actually make, you know, that's, that's leading to the feelings that you're having, right? It's because it's been locked away so long that it's, it's dying and you're feeling that you're, you're sickening. Um, and that's what happens to us when we don't create, because we're all born to create. Only, the only question is what is it that we're supposed to create? 
and so what start once a week it can only be half an hour i mean if you can if you can get a little bit more time than that that'd be great but do something that you don't normally do but that you really want to do you know that really lights you up creative and it doesn't have to be grand or anything it could be very simple like it could be hey you know what i've always wanted to watercolor paint or i want to you know i've always wanted to you know i haven't built a model airplane in in decades you know i'd like to do that again or you know i'd like to do some gardening you know i just i want to get out out in the dirt you know i, I spend so much time behind a computer screen i just want to be outside i want to feel dirt running through my fingers you know uh it could literally be anything uh it's an interest it's something that you know, that you find joy in just the act of it it brings you joy i think you need to experience that as a human being to be to be human, to remain human, to, to get reconnected with yourself, with who you really are. Um, and I think each week, try to stretch yourself to do something different. Uh, and then I think, you know, after just a few weeks, it's amazing what that does to you as a human being. Uh, it's just amazing how invigorating it is to know that you did that. You, you, no matter how busy you were, you were able to invest just a little bit of time in yourself and you feel so much better now. There's just like this relief because you've released all that tension, that pressure that's been building up for so long. Uh, and it's amazing the effect it has in other areas of your life too. Um, you know, when you get reinvigorated like that, when you get kind of re-energized, it really translates to every part of your life, including your job. You're a much happier person. You're much more well-adjusted. Uh, people notice it, even if you don't. Um, even the smallest things matter there. Um, your creativity at work is improved. Your creativity with your family improves. You know, every all of it improves. And I think so that's why, you know, creativity isn't necessarily something you try to enhance in one area. Creativity, you know, when you expose yourself to it, when you create, your creativity across the board is enhanced. And that's one thing I've learned uh without a doubt that that's true. Um, and so I think outside of the job, outside of work, outside of corporate try to invest in yourself in those ways. And again, it doesn't have to take a lot of time, just a little bit will, will work wonders. Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned it can be anything that gives you joy or fulfillment. A lot of people <laughs> that are in this cage feeling right now, they grew up knowing that every action had to have utility, had to have return on investment, the productivity movement, which makes sure that we're hyper efficient to get effective results in every aspect of life, a career at home, everything needs to have utility, some sort of output. We become so obsessed with this, we lose the feelings of joy and playfulness and things that we know can spark every element of life to be better. We can be better at work, we can be more targeted, more impactful, we can be more present at home life. And isn't it that exactly what we want? to feel good wherever we go. So if you're not giving yourself the time to be creative and playful, and it can be writing, it could be watercolor, it could be gardening, those are the things, and some people might wave this off right now, they'll be like, oh, that, that woo woo play stuff, no, I'm a nine to five, I'm crushing it. And like, seriously, if you don't have these things in your life, you are suffering in ways you don't actually understand right now. And you are capping your potential professionally and personally, because you're not taking this stuff seriously. So here, William, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> that's, a, that's a key point, too. I mean, I, I cannot overemphasize that. You will not understand just how far down you've gone in terms of the creative aspects of your life, because you're living in that, you know, you're, you're, the, you're kind of living the life. It's very hard to be objective about how you're living your life and what it looked like compared to what it was previously. But I can guarantee you, if you're not doing things for the pure joy of it, your creativity is lacking. Your potential, you know, you're not, you're not anywhere near your creative potential. Uh, and when I say creativity and creative potential, I mean your ability to innovate. Um, so if I'm in technology, my ability to come up with innovative solutions, uh, to be very creative about how I approach my work, about how I solve problems, it suffers massively when I'm in that kind of condition where I'm uh, you know, I'm feeling weighed down a little bit. I'm, I'm just feeling off. Uh, those are, that's a signal that you're sickening a little bit. And so you need to go create, you need to do things and, and creating always brings joy. Um, that's the kind of creating I'm talking about. If, if you're creating something just for utility, yeah, that's necessary for necessity. 
uh, in some areas of our life. We have to do those things. But beyond that, why bother creating something that just has utility and has no value to you personally outside of that? I mean, uh, I mean, if, if, again, as long as we're outside of the area of necessity, uh, why? I mean, what is the point? Your time here is limited on earth. Why would you spend it doing things that bring you no joy? Right. To me, that's the biggest value of all in life is bringing joy either to yourself or other people. Um, and so that's what you got to focus on. And, and I think even if, you, again, if, even if you could just get a little small drop of that every once in a while, it's pretty potent. And it, it really just uh, it, it changes your life in significant ways. And like I said, even if you don't notice it at first, other people will notice it. You'll see them looking at you a little strangely or. Uh, they'll, they'll just be surprised at who this person is. Like, who are you? Um, you know, where's that cranky, sullen, you know, downtrodden person I was speaking to last week? Like what happened to you? Yeah. <laughs> That's what they'll be thinking. They might not say yeah. it, but we miss robot 23 dash a point five. Exactly. Like we miss that. Exactly. <laughs> Who's this human being now? <laughs> yeah. You've got your own thoughts and joy. Oh my gosh. Amazing. So before we get to a, a few rapid fire questions that I want to hit with you. I want to complete a circle in our conversation. So we talked about as you got towards mm -hmm. the pandemic, you were wrestling with corporate and you decided you need to get out and explore other sides for you. We've unpacked that, the prolific creator, what creativity can mean. You've given mm -hmm. some practical advice. Uh, you're now at a point, as you described to me, and this brings me joy to hear, is you're, you're thinking about going back into corporate on your own terms, of course. I would love to understand... Right. What's your thought process here? And as you potentially make that move, how would you design it so that it's to your fulfillment and liking? Yeah, so I mean, I, I feel very fortunate that I've spent the last couple of years outside of corporate. I mean, I've, I've been doing freelancing on, you know, on the side just because I, I still enjoy technology. But most of what I've been, done, been doing has really not, not much at all to do with technology and, and, and really much more to do with aspects of creativity and philosophy and, you know, some of these deep areas that I've been exploring lately. And they've, they've given me a chance to really evaluate my value system, uh, what's important in my life, the types of things I will do and the types of things I absolutely will never do again. Um, and I'm getting older, so I've earned that right, I think, you know, to be a little crotchety in some respects. Uh, and so, I, one of the things, one of the things I've learned, um, and I, I kind of learned this from others first, like the, the Simon Parsons of the world, and you know they they often spoke about abundance. And early on, I was I had struggled with that concept a little bit. Uh, I didn't really know what that meant, um, but I found out as a creator, you know, so somebody who's constantly being creative in, in many different ways. And when you do that long enough, you start to understand that there's this there's this I just call it the source, for lack of a better term out there, this source that you draw from when you create. And when you uh, people who've, who've, who've connected to it know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like this, it's just vast, it's, un, it's un, unfathomable. It's just like, there's so much of it, you just feel like dwarfed by it. Um, but it's not like in a scary way. It's, it's more like in a, wow, I mean, I, there's just so much there to draw upon. And one of the key indicators of it is when you finish doing something you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, that's not me. Like, like, well, that's so weird. <laughs> that's not something I would typically do. It's almost like you're channeling something, right? And so, you know, I've, I've, I, I've learned that that's what abundance is. And we often, uh, we have trouble connecting to it because we, we clog the pipes with all these other things, you know, all these, these expectations, these limits, these obligations that we have. What, what we think about other people, about how they think about us, all this stuff just clogs up those pipes and, and prevents us from connecting to that source. Uh, but we're born to connect to the source. It's an integral part of us. And I think it's also what maybe connects us all together creatively. And so I, I know what that is now. Um, I've experienced it many times. And I know it's important even in, in any part of my life. So professionally, it's incredibly important too there. And so I want to, I want to work in a place that allows me to do that sort of thing that doesn't get in my way. And the, and the way I'm going to do that is, you know, people talk about culture a lot, and I think that's kind of an overloaded word, but I want to find people who are very open-minded, very creative in, in the way they approach the world, um, 
again, diverse sets of expertise, um, but just these lifelong learners, you know, kind of lifelong apprentice type people. I think that matters in terms of going back on my own terms. I want, I want to work with people like that. I don't want to work with the typical corporate BS anymore. It's not going to fly with me anymore. I don't have time for that anymore in my life. And so when I work with people like that, that means I don't have a lot standing in my way of connecting to that source of creativity. And I can bring the full force of that into my work, right? Um, I'm not, I don't have the, the, clog, the, the pipes clogged up anymore. And so that's important to me going back. And in fact, the opportunity that I'm staring at, the main reason it's there is not actually because of my technology expertise, although I think I'm, you know, I, I try to be the best at what I do. And I think I probably am among the best at what I do. Uh, and that's come from decades of work, but that's not the biggest value here. It's, it turns out the biggest value um, in, in, in getting me on this job is, my, is the work I've been doing the last two years, which completely blew my mind. I'm like, what? I mean, this is a, this is a technology position and you're telling me you're really interested in, in, in the creativity side of things. You're interested in what I've been writing about and you're interested in how that might impact the culture of the company going forward. That just blew my mind. Um, and so that was a sign to me that, okay, the, the universe works in really weird ways. It throws things at you often when you don't think you're ready. And part of the abundance mindset is just accept it, accept it for what it is. And even if it's scary, even if it seems like it's too much, embrace it, go for it, right? You're, you're not going to be given any, any more than you can actually handle. Um, and it, it takes a little while to get used to that idea, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to embrace this. And I think it's a way for me to take what I've been working on the last two years to the, to the next level, right. To actually apply it back to the world I came from and really maybe make that world what I thought it always could have been, you know, when I was younger and more idealistic. Uh, but again, doing it in a much more practical, thoughtful way. Beautiful rationale and why you would consider it again. And why this feels like it makes a lot of sense. It, it makes me think about literally like take Neo unplugging from the matrix, flying <laughs> high above, looking down and be like, well, now I choose where I insert myself and how this is me in control. I am like the neutral observer of this world, right? Directing it and engaging it how I choose. I am no longer just falling victim to default behavior and cultures and nonsense, but I'm questioning it. I am. Yeah dictating it, creating it in ways that serve me and frankly, serve other people. Yeah. I think that's really important, Matt. It's, you know, when you work in these environments, it's not a one-way street, you know, you have a say in this. Um, and maybe it takes some time to, to get that across to actually have your impact, but no matter what the situation is, you as a human being, you have a say in how things are conducted in that environment. And, you know, change, whenever you're thinking about things being differently, it always starts with you yourself. And leadership is not a title. It's a way of life. And everyone can lead in this respect. Um, and, you know, it's funny for me, you bring up the Matrix thing. I, I was I'm thinking of this latest opportunity as, you know, there's that scene in the first Matrix movie where Neo is told to follow the white rabbit. Um, and it turns out the white rabbit's a tattoo you know, on some girl's shoulder that, that comes to his door. And it's like, it's totally expected. You, you, you mean, he's probably thinking it's a real white rabbit, right? Well, this, this job is that white rabbit for me. It showed up in a totally unexpected form, but I recognized it for what it was. And so I'm following the white rabbit. So I'm encouraging everyone to look out for that, that white rabbit. Eyes wide open. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Want to do a few rapid fires, William? Let's go for it. All right. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? There are so many, I and mean, this, this one's really, this one's really hard, uh, but I would say you're never going to be ready with anything. You're never going to be fully ready with anything in your life. So just get started, get going. To me, that was the best advice I'd, I think I've ever received. And in fact, it's probably had the, the biggest impact on my life. Like my coach tells me, messy action before you're ready. Just go, go, go. Exactly. Yeah. You're never yeah, going to be ready the for best. the job. For yeah. parenting, getting married, none of the big <laughs> stuff. True. Just get into it. Deep You'll end, never be ready please. for that baby. <laughs> no, no, no. Heck no. But you know, that, that baby will teach you how to care for a baby. Uh, oh, and that's, yeah. I always like to say that action is, is life's best classroom. Yeah. So, you know, we, we're creatures of motion. We have to be in motion. That's how we learn. 
you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna learn much or you're not gonna gain much wisdom by just sitting there and thinking and pontificating about what could be no that's what academics do what's (laughs) (laughs) what's the worst piece of advice you've received work hard (laughs) that is by far the worst advice i've ever gotten in my entire life and i come from a family that we are hard workers i mean we that's our job to outwork everybody right that's that's like what i've always been told growing up you know just outwork everyone um and i think to some extent there's 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 truth in it but there's there's something missing i think that's the the, the thing that was wrong with the advice is there's something missing from the advice i think you need to work hard but in a direction that's what was missing um because i don't want to just be busy you know there's there's this epidemic of busyness and i know you know you know exactly what i'm talking about right you're 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 trying to get things done, checking off the checklist, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? But you, you never seem to like get anywhere or break out of that. You feel like you're on a treadmill. The, the, you know, the, the to-do list keeps getting longer and longer, no matter how hard you work. It just, it, it's like you're stuck in this, this, you know, groundhog day cycle. Yeah. And brutal. so you have to find the direction. Like what, what are you doing this for? Why are you doing it? What's the purpose of it? It doesn't have to be weighty, you know, or some grand meaning. It just, there has to be some reason why you're doing it. So find the reason, because that reason helps simplify the decisions for you. It really helps you focus on, on, on really prioritizing what's the most important thing to do in this moment. Mm-hmm. And it has to be something that eventually is meaning of your own creation rather than adopting the meaning that others have in their lives, because we know that leads to a state of emptiness. Yeah. We got to figure out what it means to us. Yeah, don't don't spend your life building someone else's dream. I mean, it's okay to help out, right? Especially uh, with with fellow travelers. But at some point, when are your own dreams going to get reten- you know receive your attention? You know, you're yeah. the only one that can bring them into form. And as I wrote today, if you don't get to it, then your 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 dreams, your ideas are going to end up in the graveyard of dreams. And that's a massive, unf- again, another. <laughs> Almost like the source, it's almost as unfathomable in its scope. How many dreams have died with people, and you cannot allow yours to be, you know, to 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 go down with that same fate. Yeah, the richest, great, the richest place in the world. The yeah, graveyard. that's exactly it. That's wild. Probably the biggest treasure in, in in the world is right there. Yeah. What advice would you give to yourself if you were starting your career today? Be true to yourself above all else. And it's, it's hard to understand what that really means, especially when you're younger. Um, but really what it means is you've got to invest time in getting to know who you are uh, and, and knowing that person inside of you. I think we spend a lot of time looking outward a lot. At, and when we look outward, what we're seeing is what people reflect back at us. So what they expect from us, what we're supposed to do, um, and you know, there's, there's merit to some of that to a certain extent, because you want to be a good citizen, you know, you don't want to be some crazy person going off and hurting people and doing crazy things, uh, of that nature. But, you know, to, to help the world, uh, it, you really need to help yourself kind of first. I mean, it, it seems kind of like mom and apple pie, but how can you help anybody if you can't figure out your own self? Like you can't figure, you, you can't get your own house in order. Like, how are you supposed to help anyone else? Um, now, I'm sure you can accidentally help other people, but you can't do it with a purpose. You can't do it consistently. So if you're going to show kindness, you have to have kindness for yourself. If you're going to if you're going to try to help people through their struggles, right, you have to at least know what that's like yourself. How are you working with your own struggles? You know, you have to you have to find out uh, you know, part of like finding your meaning or your purpose. And I think it changes throughout your life, but you have to keep on top of it. You have to. You have to, you know, in, invest in those moments. If you don't do that, then basically what you're going to be is an also ran. You're going to be a carbon copy of someone else. You'll be like, you know, kind of a, you know, a lesser version of someone else. When really your biggest competitive advantage in life is being who you are because there's no one like you. There's never been anyone like you and there never will be anybody like you. You are unique. You're a miracle. You know, what it took to get you born, the person that you are, with all the traits that you have, the way you look, the way you act, the way you feel, your ideas, your perspective, the experiences you've had, all that adds up to this unique being. And I think you need to embrace that. There's, a, there's so much power in that concept. Yeah. Know thyself. You're one of one. Beautiful statements. Though. Yeah. 
It's, it's one of those simple, powerful life truths. And we spend our whole life really learning to appreciate that. And I can tell you, I really appreciate it at my age. A few things to wrap us up, William. What does uncaged mean to you? I think I'm, I, I would draw a parallel to what we were just talking about. It's, it's being true to yourself. So again, above making ends meet, you have to find out what it is that lights you on fire, right? Um, and even before you can find out maybe what lights you on fire, you just got to kind of follow the heat, you know, where, <laughs> you know, what, what makes, you know, kind of that happiness, the joy, those are kind of key indicators that you're going in the right direction. So, you, you know, you're not, it's not some big meaning that comes to you in the middle of the night, uh, through some vision. It's, it's, it's incremental. It's you, you get clarity one step at a time. Um, it's almost like playing the game of hot and cold, right? So you have to start doing that and just keep playing that game all throughout life and it will serve you well. Beautiful. Got to nourish it. Yeah. Where can people connect with you online? Uh, probably the, the biggest place I hang out is on LinkedIn. So look me up on LinkedIn. Yeah, William Wilson, the guy, the weird guy that has the infinity symbol in between his first and his last name. <laughs> Unique. Um, I also have a sub stack called adventures in life. Um, although that's probably going to get transferred over to my website, which is the prolific creator.co. Um, that's where you'll find all, uh, all of my work. I'm still trying to get all the old stuff on there, but all the new stuff will be there. Uh, and that's probably the best place to figure out what's going on with me and what I'm up to lately. Yeah. It's magnificent work. We'll make sure to link to it in the show notes. Any closing message you'd like to leave with our audience today? Yeah, I would I just I just want to remind people that look, you're we're only here on this earth for a brief instant in time. And every every second, every moment counts. You can't you know the past is fixed. Uh the future is it's really it's not very, it's not easily discerned and nothing you do will make that any clearer. You only have this moment. And this is a very, you know, stoic comment, but really focus in on the moment. What is the number one thing you can do right now in each of the major areas of your life, right? To get closer to what you hope to accomplish. Don't settle for just sitting somewhere just because you think you have to, right? Just because you think you have to earn this much money, just because you think you, you have to earn this, this level of respect, just because you, you, know, you think you have to have the fancy title, the big house, you know, whatever it is you think you have to have, those, those are material things. It's really the experiences in life that matter. Um, and, and that's what you really should be focusing on. And so I know that's hard to think about, especially when we're younger, uh, and especially when we think we have our whole lives ahead of us, but you're only guaranteed this moment. Who knows what happens tomorrow? I mean, I've, I've lost, lost my father suddenly. I've lost other people in my life suddenly. You know, it, it, when, you, when that sort of thing happens to you, it brings it home to you all over again, the importance of the moment and really seizing it in, in, in every way you possibly can. Uh, and there has to be some urgency to it, right? So I think a good, uh, a good stoic um, you know, phrase that I like to use a lot is memento mori. So remember, you must die. And remember it not because it's morbid, but just because it gives you a sense of urgency. And I think having that sense of urgency is a good thing in your life. It'll really help it really helped focus you on what matters most to you in life, right? So you can really, again, focus your efforts in that area and not on all these extraneous things that people think are important, but really aren't. Great summary. I think the whole idea is that if I were to zoom out, we really can't accept the defaults we're given in life, whether it's work or otherwise, because as soon enough, we're going to start feeling, if we're lucky enough, that sense of urgency, that memento mori feeling that we only have so much time left and we have this creative potential, this human potential that we're not tapping just by falling in line with everyone else. We know that we're living a small life and we have to know thyself. We have to take bold risks. We need to follow our intuition to live the big life that we know we are capable of. Yeah, that's on point. Live a big life. You know, accepting the, a small caged life, that's no way for a human being to live. That's not a human thing to do. Human beings live big. We create big. We think big. We do big. That's what, that's what we do. And, and I, I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't do that. And if you fall short, that's fine because you aimed high. So you're still going to go far. So, so I know exactly 
I know exactly, William, why you were attracted to astronauts now. Yeah. Aiming really we high. Aim really high. Uh, yeah, <laughs> orbit. Here we go. Hey, my friend, this was great having you today. Thanks so much for your time. It was a great discussion. Thanks for having me. All right, Appreciate take it. care. Hey, Matt here. Thanks for listening to Uncage Yourself. For show notes and more content like this, head over to uncageyourself.fm. And if you liked what you heard, I'd appreciate you leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Until next time, be well, my friend.